Well, hello, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in the TRS-80 Model 4P series. Hopefully it's not too much of a series, but uh, let's see if we can try to get this machine fixed in this video. In the last video, I was able to bench test the motherboard here after taking the entire computer apart and found that it loaded TRS-80 Model 3 software perfectly. Even though while the motherboard was installed in the case with the original power supply and everything, it wouldn't actually load those same exact disks. So something's wrong there. But I also figured out that while on the bench, it couldn't load any TRS-80 Model 4 software. It would just start loading on this disk drive right here for just a second or two and then stop with nothing on screen at all. So clearly something's still going wrong with this computer. So in this video, I guess the first thing to do is let's try to get this motherboard booting Model 4 software and validate that that works. Then I can focus on the CRT which was not working right away, and also the power supply, which is probably one of the issues as well. Could be the disk drives that were in that computer are also not working, because obviously I'm not using that right here on the bench. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Let's first talk about this test setup I'm using on the bench for testing this stuff. So this is the 4P motherboard that came out of the computer and it is connected here back there, as you can't really see, to an RGB to HDMI. So I can display the video on the computer and also capture it. I also have this, which is the power supply from the Model 3. And luckily it is turned off, but there it is. I figured out in the first video that it has the same exact pinout as the Model 3. So if you're trying to bench test one of these and you have a spare Model 3 power supply, you can go ahead and use it. This is the floppy drive I've been using for testing. This is like an old CD-ROM case or something that I put a 360K drive in here. It is double-sided. It's set for drive select zero. I like this because it has a built-in power supply and I just have the straight through ribbon cable here, which has both an edge connector and a pin header type connector that can connect to motherboards and whatnot. So it's perfect for testing. I know that this drive works perfectly. I have tested it quite a bit, so no issues there. And this is how I got the system booting those Model 3 disks. Over here, you see my bench PC. It's a 36SX, and it does have a 360K drive connected to it as well. And the reason this is here is because after making the first part, I realized that I think there's something wrong with my PC that I usually use to make disks. I think the 360K drive in there is malfunctioning. And the reason why is because I use IMD to make disk images and also test and align disk drives. And it seemed like when I put a known working disk into that PC, it didn't seem to be able to read it properly. So I wanted to eliminate those variables and I set this up on the bench here uh, with its own floppy controller and a known working drive so I could create those new Model 4 disks for testing the booting on here. And when I did that, yeah, it still didn't boot properly. And these are known working Model 4 IMD disk images that should absolutely boot a Model 4. So that's where we are right now. I think the first thing I need to do is let's get the computer booted back up again and let's uh, try to investigate what's going on with not being able to boot the Model 4 software. One thing I wanna add really quickly is that I do not yet have a diagnostic ROM that I can install on this motherboard for testing all the memory in this. That would be very helpful, but due to architectural differences between the Model 4 and the 4P and the Model 3 and the Model 1, I can't just use the Model 3 ROM in this motherboard. It will not work. This thing has 128K of RAM. It supports bank switching out the ROM, bank switching out the RAM. Uh, it may support bank switching out the video memory. I can't quite remember that. But either way, there are several different bank switching configurations, which is clearly completely different than the Model 3. So putting the Model 3 ROM in there won't work. David, who did almost all the work on the diagnostic ROM, especially for the Model 2, he did all of the work on that one. He is working on a ROM for the Model 4 and the 4P. It's just a bit more complex of an architecture and a little less well-documented, so it's taking him a little bit of time. Before the end of this video, which I don't know when I'm gonna actually finish it in time, that diagnostic ROM might be available. It's just not at this time. Okay, there's a lot of talking hands so far. Let's dig into this motherboard. So one of the things I have not tested on this computer yet is the keyboard. Now, Seth mentioned that he was using this computer before he sent it to me, so I'm assuming the keyboard fully works. Hopefully it's not a foam and foil keyboard that will need a complete refoaming. Anyhow, the thing is, I think I noticed in the service manual, which I have up on the screen here, 
that this machine actually has some rudimentary diagnostics in this boot ROM here. So let's try to run those. I'll just need to plug the keyboard into this thing. Maybe there's a RAM test in here that can at least tell me if this 128K of RAM is working because possibly there's some problems in the RAM and that's causing the Model 4 software not to load. You know, anything is possible, right? I'm just noticing here, there's an entire maintenance and troubleshooting section. Maybe I should have started here. So let's see if there's anything interesting at all. It's talking about, uh, yeah, when you turn it on, you should see the floppy drive is not ready. And we know we never saw that message when I turned it on before, but I have now seen that message with this thing on the bench. I have not seen CRC error or seek error. And then it says insert the TRS-DOS 6.11 disk and try to boot. I've actually tried booting TRS-DOS 6.12 and that just does the exact same thing. It loads for a second and then just stops. It says if you don't get an error about the floppy drive or you, the logo shows up, then a problem exists on the main board. Really, that is revolutionary thinking there. Okay, I'm sorry, being facetious here. Uh, that's kind of an obvious situation. <laughs> I'm scrolling down a little bit further, and right here we see the memory maps that this thing has got. So this is the one, obviously, it powers up in. So it's got a boot ROM 4K and then RAM 10K read only. Now, this one right here is where 14K is read only. This is clearly what happens is it loads that Model 3 ROM set into that first 14K. And then what it will do is it probably bank switches or it changes from uh, mode 0 to, well mode zero again. Um, <laughs> okay, I don't quite get that. Uh, but either way, this first 14K RAM is read only, which means there's probably an IO port somewhere on this machine, which allows writing to that part of the memory while it's loading the ROM set for the Model 3 off the disk. And then you hit that IO port and that RAM becomes read only. And that way running software or if the computer crashes while in Model 3 mode, it won't corrupt that RAM that currently is holding the ROM. That way you can reset the machine and it will boot as normal without needing that first floppy disk to load the ROM set in. Ah, and here we go. Here are some of the other modes here. This allows writing to the RAM and there's just normal RAM with read and write. And then when we keep scrolling down, these are the modes right here that are for the Model 4 operation. In fact, mode three here, it's probably for the CPM mode. Notice the keyboard and video RAM down at the bottom here and you can actually bank those in and out. And that's typically how you would get a full 64K on a CPM machine even on a Z80 machine like this, it only has 64K of address space. The extra 64K that's in the, the top part of memory here is actually switched in and out using these select registers. And then if you're gonna write to the screen or read from the keyboard, you have to temporarily turn those on by switching to this mode over here on the left, which then allows the BIOS to do the reading and writing to the screen and the keyboard or whatever needs to be done. And then it switches back to this one over here. So you have the full memory available. This is very typical for the way CPM machines work and none of this was available on the Model 1 and 2, which is why I can't run CPM. Okay, so right here we can see that for the initialization of the system, it does all this stuff here. We know this is all working, right? It's booting the Model 3 software, but look right here, tests for the uh, greater than, less than, or I guess the period key being pressed. And it says, uh, if those are pressed, then control is transferred to the diagnostic package. All other keys are scanned via the keyboard scanner. And if we keep reading down here, the keyboard scanner is now called to scans the keyboard for a set period of time and returns several parameters based on which key is pressed. All right, looks like you're able to control how the boot process is running when you go into this special mode. So hard disk boot, floppy drive boot, model three boot, future use, boot from RS-232, reserved for future use, control and caps. Mm, okay, I'm not really seeing anything here about diagnostics though. I thought I was gonna have like a RAM test or something, but I don't see that at all. And here's a little tidbit here. If loading a Model 4 operating system, the boot ROM will always transfer control to the first byte of the boot sector, which is 4300 hex. If you're loading a Model 3 OS or you're about to use the Model 3 Basic and the transfer address is 3015. What's not totally clear to me is that jumping to 4300, that's just in the normal memory space and the RAM should be working actually. I mean, it's running the Model 3 software and it's gonna use that same part of RAM. But I don't really know what the Model 4 OS is doing once it continues. Like maybe it's trying to switch the video mode into 80 columns and then that's where this computer is freezing. Unfortunately, like it's just not giving any clues to what's going on and that's where the diagnostic ROM would be pretty helpful. So. I'm gonna keep digging through this to see if any kind of clues jump out at me of uh, places to start with testing. 
All right, what I've gone ahead and done is I connected the keyboard again, and even just to get this on, I had to uh, take the screws out. <laughs> and really questionable decisions Radio Shack made. The marking on the cable shows pin one is facing towards me. There's a mark right there. And yet on the motherboard, pin one is towards the back. So those two marks are contradictory to each other. I went back and reviewed the footage from part one just to make sure that I wasn't doing it wrong and I wasn't. And actually, because there's a notch on the cable, you can't even plug it in upside down just due to the actual clearance on the board. So anyways, I want to test out going into that, that diagnostic mode by holding down the period key. And earlier I said it was the brackets and the period, but, but I think they were just trying to say in the documentation, push the period key, and they put little brackets around it. It's really just the period key. So let me plug this in. Let's give this a try. Uh, disk drive is off, so we should get the message about... Oh, there we go. Floppy drive is not available. So what I'm going to do is uh, the keyboard is right here. I'm going to hold down the period key, and I'm going to press the reset button. Well, press it. I'm going to push it with the jumper here. Okay, diagnostic RAM test. Dynamic RAM test. Push enter to begin. Okay, I don't know why it's sort of flickering as well. Also, why doesn't even, it doesn't even mention that this is a thing in the, uh, in the manual there. It didn't say anything about a RAM test. Okay, uh, is this actually running here? Modified address test, load, mask five. Oh no, it's still running. Oh look, it's even using the stack down in the corner here. How funny, They're, so it's using the video RAM as the processor stack, just like we were doing in the original early versions of the Model 1 and Model 3 test. Later, we stopped doing that because David came up with a new way to do, to do the March test without needing that. I mean, so far, this doesn't seem to have a problem. I'm assuming if it detects any kinds of issues, it's gonna say address, retry, read, written, and mask, gonna show text below uh, that second line there. But so far, it's showing nothing. So let's let this run, see what happens. Well, at this point, the RAM test appears to be looping. Like it's doing a mask of F, and now it's just, yeah, started back at zero. System is working. So let's uh, reboot, try loading a game here. I wanna see if this works. So this game disc does not have the Model 3 ROM set on it, which is why you gotta first boot uh, the disc I just did. And now I'm gonna hit reset with the jumper and that should now load this game. Or not. Okay, there we go. I was about to say it wasn't booting. Anyhow, this is 13 Ghosts, which is a really fun, kind of graphical game for the Model 3 and the Model 1. It uses the text characters, which is what you're seeing on the tier 80 Model 3 graphic there. It's a pretty impressive game, I have to say, uh, you know, for what these systems are. And it does run on the Model 1. That's right, and there's actually sound. Doesn't sound so great through the little tiny beeper that's on the motherboard here. Is that even showing up? Yep, that's it there. Uh, normally, you'd have to hook something up to the cassette port and you'd hear some multi-channel sound even. Anyhow, there's the game. Um, how do we control this? I don't really remember, okay. You gotta shoot these ghosts. I can't remember how to move up and down. <laughs> Trying to figure out the keys here. Left and right arrow, do that. Uh, oh, here we go, these arrow keys, yes. So as you can see, it's got like pretty good animation <laughs> for such an old machine. I uh, got that spider. It's pretty fun. And you can imagine that that static should not be there. So David, who was working on the diagnostic ROM, he sent me a copy of this technical bulletin index here for the Model 4P, which is what I have up on screen. And I skimmed through it last night looking for potential issues with this machine. Now, when we look here at this one, there's a technical bulletin about RAM problems due to glitch in the 240 nanosecond delay tap output. This is the delay right here. This is a Valor uh, delay. And it says right here that there's a glitch in the 240 nanosecond delay here uh, with a date code of 8351 or less. Well, there's no date code printed on this, but I can see on all the ICs around it that they have date codes that are less than that. So I'm gonna assume that that is also less. The glitch causes RAM problems, usually preventing the system from booting. In the following procedure, ending the 120 nanosecond and the 240 nanosecond delay tap stabilizes the 240 nanosecond delay line properly with clock U115. 
and it tells us what to do here. So cut the run from the solder pad next to the U15 pin four, see attached artwork, and then a jumper, there's a couple jumper pins here, and it has a little picture as well. And looking at the motherboard here, I mean, there's obviously these bodge wires here, but I don't think this is necessarily related because it's talking about U129, U115, U97, and U97, which are all ICs up in this area here, not this area here. I actually read through all the bulletins there looking for any particular service bulletin about this bodge mess here, and none of the ones in there are described to be related to this. So if you're watching this or you saw it in the first part, please let me know if you recognize what this bodge is. All of these wires seem to be connected properly though, so I don't think like anything is disconnected here that might be causing this botch to fail. I think what I should probably do is remove this motherboard from the uh, metal carrier here. So take a look at the bottom side just to make sure that none of this mod work has been done there. All right, let's flip this over. Oh, take a look at this. We do have bodges that are done here. We got bodges, everyone. Now this area right here, hopefully that shows up in the camera. Yeah, this is where that delay line is. And there are wires running way over there to what chip is that? Looks like it's going to U129. And when we check up here, oh, you, okay, there you go. So that mod's already been done. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of bodges going on here. What is all this? Look at this stuff here, there. <laughs> it was all hiding under there, <laughs> all these bodges. Oh boy. All right, is right there is the cut, or here, there it is, right there. That's where the cut was made according to uh, the instructions. So yeah, I'm gonna say that this particular mod was installed properly, this, uh, this delay line mod that it's talking about. Now what I'm doing now is I'm just inspecting the rest of these bodges. It looks like this one here, they cut the insulation a bit too short. It may have actually been shorting to a pin that it shouldn't be touching and it's definitely not soldered on there. So I'm gonna grab a little capped on tape and we're just gonna try to fix that. All right, there we go. I just, yeah, a little capped on tape over that extra pin means that there's no chance of that shorting out uh, where, it sh where it shouldn't. All righty, so let's uh, power this thing back up again and I'll plug the disk drive in. All right, I just stuck in a Model 4 disk in here. The drive is on and let's reboot. Let's see if this works. I mean, I'm not anticipating it will work at all. So it's accessing the drive right now. It's not even seeking and then it just stops. So same exact problem as before. All right, I have reconfigured the bench here to make it a little bit easier for me to troubleshoot. I have on this disc here, the Model 4 Diagnostics. I saw this on a YouTube video and someone was using it and it seems to boot into what looks like TRS-80 Model 3 mode. And I'm gonna reboot here, touch those pins to reset it. It boots into Model 3 mode, which you can just see behind the camera here. And the good thing about that is that's actually working on this machine. And that means that I can run through various tests on here for like 80 columns, 128K, things that are specific to the Model 4 mode to see if they're arrowing out on this. And then possibly that gives me an idea of where to go down the troubleshooting path. Okay, so we're presented with a bunch of different things here. I'm gonna skip over the hard drive testing, the floppy drive stuff. I mean, I know the floppy drive's fine communication port, I don't care about that right now. Let's go to M for memory diagnostic. Okay, so we have 16K memory diagnostic and 64 slash 128K. Um, let's try the 64 slash 128K. Let's see what happens. Now, obviously to use all that memory, there's gonna have to be some bank switching. Okay, it is now beeping out of the speaker, which, okay, that works. Whoa, and then it just blanked out the screen. I could barely read the messages that went across the screen. I'll be able to see it in editing, but whatever that was, uh, the computer is blanked out now. I don't think it should be blank right now. So I think clearly whatever's going on with this system is manifesting itself right here with this RAM test. Now the other RAM test, the one we were running a second ago, that, that seemed to work, but this one, no. All right, well, I'm going to reset this machine. I just dropped the chip puller that I was using to reset the computer and I hit the floor and like literally I don't see it anymore. It like bounced away. All right, so memory test diagnostics, we know that doesn't work. Let's do the video test one, and let's see if I can make this thing go into 80 columns mode, because that's certainly one of the key characteristics of running Model 4 software. It's besides the additional memory that it has, is it runs in 80 columns mode, which I think uses a different clock signal. So we're gonna push I for Model 4 video and keyboard tests. 
Uh, it's a little bit of a box screen. What's happening? Did it freeze already? I did. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. All right, so let's just start with number three, which is 32 character mode, which is like we're in 64 column mode right now. It should just be double width. All right, this looks okay, clearly. 32 character mode, R to return to the pre previous menu. And then six for 64 character mode. We know this is working because that's what we're already running in. Okay, so here's the test. I'm gonna push eight for 80 column mode. And that's it. The system has frozen. Well, it appears to have frozen at least. All right, so what I haven't done is double check to see if while it's black screen like this, that there is actually a video signal that maybe the RGB to HDMI is misbehaving like it was in part one. So I have the oscilloscope up right here on the screen. And on this lower part here, we have the video outputs uh, pinout. Let's just scroll up a little bit. And I have the oscilloscope right here. And the video signal is pin two, and I am on pin two right now. And you'll see there that there's actually getting nothing on the video signal. So let's check out the sync signals. Pin six is horizontal sync, which is this right here. It just looks high. So we've lost our sync altogether. I need to reboot this computer. Let's exit out of here. Get back into the... Uh... Oh, look at that. As soon as I hit reset, sync signal came back. So whatever's going on when it goes into 80 columns mode, because that's the test we were running, it, the sync disappeared and so did the video signal. So that's actually good. I mean, it's good in that it's a clue as to what might be going on. So we look at the schematics here. If we follow the wires back, they go all the way to here. Horizontal vertical sync is right there on the uh, 6845. Well, there's a very bespoke version of the 6845 used on these machines that I don't think I could just stick a normal one in, but it is, uh, it's coming from pins 40 and 39 on that chip. Sorry, I just turned on my cursor highlighting. Okay, so we lost the sync signal, H sync coming out of there. Now the thing is, uh, this thing has a clock signal that goes into a pin 21 here. Uh, that is the clock signal that is powering the 6845. So clearly without that clock signal, it's not gonna generate any kind of sync. So right here, this is the IC in question. I'm pretty sure pin 21 is this one. And I can see back here, we have a clock signal on here. Let's zoom in. We are getting 1.26 megahertz. Now remember the computer has rebooted and it's in like the TRS-80 Model 3 mode. So I think if I push V for video test, I'm gonna do this blindly because I am capturing the desktop right now. I can't do both, unfortunately. Uh, once the floppy stops, I'm gonna hit I for the video tests and then eight to go to the 80 column test. So let's take a look at that clock signal here. So there it is, 1.26 megahertz, and I'm gonna push eight for the 80 column test. Whoa, clock is gone. So very clearly, without a clock on the 6845, that's not gonna display any video. And quite possibly, there are other parts of the system that rely on that same clock signal. And if we look at a CRT clock right here, Maybe whatever's generating that clock is not working, and then whatever else on the system might be derived from that clock is also not working, which is why the computer just hard freezes. All right, so CRT clock comes from sheet one. Okay, so here is sheet one. And I think there it is right there, CRT clock. Now it is coming from this U127, which is this I see right here. And unfortunately, that is a PAL chip. I have no idea if someone has like reverse engineered the equations and has a JED file, so I can replace that with a GAL chip if that chip is bad. But let's not quite jump to conclusions because this thing has quite a lot of signals coming into it. In fact, there's a 12 megahertz signal and there's a 10 megahertz input into this GAL. So let's check those two because we have like mode select, 80, 64. These are all inputs over on the, uh, the, the left side and the right side is where the outputs are. Now, let's see, let's check those clock signals because if to be honest, if one of these clocks is bad, then it could well affect these other outputs. And maybe when the, mist, the system switches to 80 columns mode, it switches clocks or something like that. Alrighty, so pin one is 12 megahertz as the input and that's pin one right here. And we are seeing 20 megahertz. Oh, I'm on the wrong chip. 127 is this one. Nothing, we have nothing there. Okay, uh, let's look at pin four, which is, there it is, 10 megahertz. So this clock is good. And if we scroll over, that clock is coming from another PAL chip. Oh, okay, I think that 20 megahertz one I was looking at was on pin one there. 
there, 20 megahertz oscillator. So that goes into this PAL with 126 and out comes uh, 10 megahertz. And that is what's going into pin four. And that is there. But the 12 megahertz clock is missing. And if we scroll down, oh, look at that. That appears to be coming from this NE564. It's like a 555 timer. Now it looks like this 555 timer is somehow related to all this though, because there's the 20 megahertz crystal here. It outputs a signal. It goes into this 74LS93. And then that uh, outputs this pin 11. And that actually feeds into the 564. But there's a jumper here, E1 and E2, which is a jumper that's right here. I have my finger on it. So that is installed. So that's like an input. That must like lock whatever this oscillator is here. Uh, five volts, five volts. Okay, there's a variable capacitor. It's gotta be uh, this one right here for adjusting the frequency. I think the jumper here must lock this 564 to the, the master clock, like the 20 megahertz master clock on this thing. Let me test what's on this particular jumper right here. And let's see if we see a signal. Okay, we do. It's kind of low, but that's actually okay. It's going through a voltage divider here and a cap. And it is 1.26 megahertz. But let's check pin nine here on the 564 and look for an output signal, which we should be seeing, I guess, the 10 megahertz clock that goes to the video chip. All right, there we go. I'm on it. And I mean, there is a little bit of a signal there. Why don't I unplug this jumper while we're looking at the output? Oh, look at actually the little bit of activity that was on there went away, which I think is like some kind of coupling that's happening through it. Oh, and I, I'm not on the pin. There we go. Yeah, when I pull the jumper, it just, just goes away. There's no oscillation whatsoever of this 564 here. Uh, why don't I try turning maybe this little variable capacitor? Okay, turning that doesn't do anything at all. Let's take a look at the data sheet for this chip. I'm not sure I have any extras, so that's a bit of a problem. Phase locked loop. Versatile, highly guaranteed frequency phase locked loop, adjustable up to 50 megahertz. I'm assuming this is typically used in like tuners and television and radios and stuff like that, so it can uh, lock on to the various set frequencies. Now there is a possibility that the output of this chip is working, but this chip right here, this uh, 90 is shorted on the input pin or potentially the gal is as well. I think one way I could tell is if I lift resistor 47 here, this 47 ohm resistor, I just have to lift that and we'll see if the output suddenly appears. All right, well, I'm not able to find a uh, ferrite bead six or resistor 47, just not visible. I see R37, it's right down here, but I'm assuming uh, resistor 47 and the ferrite bead six is probably this one that's hanging right off here, I, I guess. Uh, U149, yeah, there's U149, goes to pin one. Yeah, okay, um, I'm assuming it's this ferrite bead and resistor that's right there. Why don't I power off the computer? I'm just gonna remove this right here. I'm assuming that's what this is. There we go. I know it's not super easy to see. I can't zoom up very well on this area, but I'm pretty sure that this is the IC here on the schematics right there, pin one. And I'm pretty sure this right here is this extra bodge resistor and ferrite bead that's on there. So when we power up the computer, let's take a look right here. We're still not getting any output from the phase locked loop chip. It's just, it's doing nothing. All right, so, I mean, ignoring all the passives that surround that PLL chip, those don't typically fail. So I'm kind of feeling like that PLL chip itself has gone bad. And that's keeping that clock from working, which anytime this thing tries to switch to 80 column mode, that fails. And maybe there's things derived off that clock that also fail, and that's why the machine just freezes. So I'm thinking that's that's gotta be what's going on. So I need to look through my stuff and try to find another NE564 chip. Hopefully I got something. Well, I think I'm gonna have to end this video here. The Model 4 diagnostic disc definitely proved quite helpful in at least getting to this point. That phase locked loop, PLL, I always have trouble saying that, that circuit definitely is not working properly. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've ordered some replacement NE564 chips, which are gonna take a couple weeks to get here. So. I'm gonna to have to shelve this project for now and work on some other stuff and then I'll get back to it once that chip comes in. When I ran the RAM diagnostic on here, there was also like a RAM error that showed up there right before it blanked out. 
So there may actually be other problems on this board, and that 80 column clock problem may just be the tip of the iceberg. I'm hoping that the PAL chip that the clock passes through derives a bunch of other signals based on that clock signal, and since that clock is just missing, well, that could easily mean that those other signals aren't gonna be working properly, which could be causing other issues as well. Now, if you've worked on these machines, and I don't know if the Model 4 is exactly the same with that circuit for the clock as the 4P, but if you've worked on these and you found that chip to be bad, or you think maybe one of those other passives that are around that chip are bad, or maybe I'm totally off base, definitely put uh, your comments down below in the comment section. I, I tried looking around the internet a little bit for potential problems with this machine, and didn't really find any information about that particular issue happening. It's definitely a little bit of a weird one, and it's funny that Seth was using this machine before he sent it to me, and he said it was working fine, but the two floppy disks that he had only ever ran it in Model 3 mode, and he never actually tested it in Model 4 mode, which of course is one of the nice features about this thing, especially if you want to use all 128K on it. So for the next part, and I do apologize that I couldn't fix this in part two, for the next part, I will put that new chip in, Hopefully that restores that clock circuit and then we can at least do some further testing on the machine to see if that fixes all the other problems and then I can reassemble the machine to have a nice working Model 4P. If you have any thoughts about the series so far, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. And of course, huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And a big thanks to Seth for saying this machine and I forgot to thank him on the end of the last video. I really appreciate that. And I think I've thanked everyone. A huge thanks to everyone I met at VCF again. Uh, it's still fresh in my mind. VCF MedWest, that is. It was simply amazing to meet all the fans and all the other YouTubers and all the other retro computer enthusiasts. It was an absolutely amazing experience. If you're thinking about going to a VCF in the future, I highly recommend it. I don't know about the other VCFs because I haven't been to them yet, but the Midwest one is an amazing show put on by an amazing bunch of individuals, and I just can't speak highly enough about it. Okay, so that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.